Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, even though my name is Jessica, please do call me Jess. Only my moms call me Jessica when she's angry. Okay, so let's keep to Jess. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone here at Five A. I'm so glad to be here today. Uh, it's very hard to see everybody with the screen in the front, and I'm very short. But anyways, uh, just for reference, who here don't know JSON Web Tokens? Raise your hand. Awesome. You're going to learn what JSON Web Tokens are today. Isn't this great? Who here knows JSON Web Tokens, heard of the name, but never used them? Awesome. Well, maybe I'll give you a reason to use them. OK, so first things first, a little disclaimer. I'm Brazilian, hence the accent. And also, I learned that other developers like myself that don't have English as a first language call JSON Web Tokens JWTs. But my English-speaking friends tend to call them JOTs, which is actually from the RFC that specify what a JOT is. So I'll be using J JWTs and JOTs throughout this talk. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you hear something that sounds like a dot, but it's not a dot, that's a jot. <laughs> and it is impossible to talk about JSON Web Tokens or jots without talking about the amazing effort that was made to create a collection of standards and um, RFCs to outline JSON objects and how to use them. And that is known as HOSE, or JSON Object Signing and Encryption. That's a very long name, so I prefer to call it HOSE. Uh, one of the RFCs that is part of Jose is actually the RFC 7519, also known as the JOT specification. And that's going to be our main focus for today, but we're also going to see two other RFCs in a little bit. And basically, this RFC outlines what a JOT is, what structure does it have, and a lot of other more information that we're going to see in just a while. So JOT usually is a standardized string that represents some information. So it does convey some meaning. And for those that have never seen a jot before, I'd like to introduce you to a first jot. It, doesn't it look nice? Yes, I do think it looks nice. Although I know for the first time you see it, it might look like a random collection of characters, numbers, and letters. And you'll think, like, this doesn't mean anything. There is no way this means anything. But it does. And if you look closely, it actually has a structure. So it has a header, it has a payload, and it has a signature. So it can actually sign tokens. So the header is the part about the JSON Web Token that speaks of the token itself. What token it is, what type of algorithm was used for signing that token. You take that JSON object. For us that do Python, it looks like a dictionary. Uh, encode it into a base64 string. That's how you get that first part of that structure that we just saw. The payload, much like the header, is also encoded into base64 string. And don't get me wrong, encoding it into base64 string only means that you are translating into base64 string. That also means that you can translate back to a JSON object. And the payload, on the other hand, different from the header that speaks of the token, is going to speak about a given resource. If you think of logging in a user and logging out a user, the resource of that token is going to be the user. So for example, the subject could be the ID of a user in your systems. You could have the information about, just give me a second. You can have information about the name of the user, their nickname, and so on and so forth. Each line of this JSON object, each line of this quote-unquote dictionary, is what we call a claim. And we have three types of claims. And I know, I said that we use a signature, but we're going to see why the signature is a little bit different. So the first type of claims is the reserved claims. Those come from the JSON Web Token uh, specification and they are standardized by the document. So you have things like the subject of that token, who created that token, the issuer, also when this token was created, what date it was created, and when the token expired. It is a good measure to have tokens expire. The second type of claims we have are the public claims. And they are standardized in a way by IANA, one of the organizations on the internet, 
And the idea would be to provide a way for everybody to communicate on the same language. Much like what we are doing here, talking English, even though I could talk to you in Portuguese, you will probably not understand myself. So the idea behind that standardization it would be to provide some interoperability and, for example, instead of using first name to refer to the first name of a person, use given name. Instead of using last name, use family name, and so on and so forth. It's a very long list. If you're curious about it, there is a link in the notes of these slides, and I'm going to share the slides at the end of this talk. The last types of claims, those are my favorite ones, because they are private claims and they mean they are specific to your systems. So anything that your systems need to work and function properly, you can put in there. As long as you give a valid JSON object, you are good to go. And it can be anything that you want, really. Uh, but be mindful of the data that you put in there. Now, let's go back to the signature. The signature, remember, is a little bit different from the header and the payload, especially because the signature provides a way for us to check whether or not that token was tampered with in between traffic, in between point A and point B. We take the header and the payload, pass it along to an algorithm, and it could be two types of algorithms, and then you get the signature, or you sign your token. Now, here I'm showing, showing a uh, algorithm that is a symmetrical algorithm. It takes the secret. And you can probably read my secrets, so it's not a good measure for me to be showing it to you. So don't worry, this is just a sample secret. I'm not using this in production. And normally, secrets actually look like something like this, a random string that was generated specifically for using as a secret. This is also a sample one. Don't worry, I'm not using this in production. <laughs> now, speaking of algorithms, there are two types of algorithms. The symmetrical one, where you have a secret that you're going to use both to sign your token and to verify your token. There is also the second type, my favorite type, the asymmetrical algorithms, because you get, you get to use a key pair, one public key and one private key. The private key is meant for signing the token. You don't share that with anybody. And the public key is meant for verifying a given token. So that one you get to share. And it's OK, because you cannot sign a token with the public key. And speaking of keys, since you want people to validate the tokens, you need to be able to share that. And that is an object made for you to share those. Those are JSON Web keys. They are very common. If you're following the standards, you're probably going to have an endpoint that is going to be available for you to grab the keys from the applications that you are using for the services that you are using. And there is an RFC for that, too. The RFC 7517 outlines what a JSON web key looks like, what sort of information must have. Uh, most libraries already know how to handle the information that is available there. Uh, so you don't have to actually be an expert in cryptography or those algorithms to know how to set the key up for being used. Now, enough about theory, a little bit. Let's see how they work in actual life. You know, Because I don't know about you, but for me, I learn more about the things that I'm reading about or learning about when I'm actually touch some code while doing so. In Python, there are a few libraries. My favorite one, SpyJot, is actually uh, maintained by Jose Padilla. He, he works at Out Zero just like I do. Uh, he's a very nice guy, uh, and he does an excellent job of maintaining this library. And PyJot, one of the reasons why I like it so much is because it's very simple to get it started. You just install it with pip and then you can import it. You're probably going to have your token inside of a variable, and look here, it is a string, so it's not much different from what we've seen before. And then you can just pass your token, pass the secret, pass the algorithms that you have for that token, and if everything goes well with your decode method, you're going to get the payload of the token back. And look, it is a dictionary. It has information about a given user, in this case, me, uh, and I can use this dictionary to adjust the flows of my applications uh, according to the preferences of my users that are available on that token. Everything is fine when everything works really well, right? But sometimes things don't go as expected, and if you have a token that has a problem, you should see a problem come up. So this is a different token than the one that I used before. It has the same secret. It uses the same algorithm, the RS-256. But this time, it is an expired token. 
So if you try to decode it, an uh, error would appear in front of you and blow up in your face. Now, errors should be treated. So good thing is, all of the libraries that do this kind of work, you can also import the errors and put that in a try except and log the information accordingly. And you can learn how to deal with those errors once they arise. Finally, this is a different type of token. So I wanted to show you not only the ones that are made with the symmetrical algorithm, but also one with an asymmetrical algorithm. You can notice that it's way bigger, but actually it is so much bigger just because I used a different type of algorithm for signing it, which is an RS-256 that takes a private key for signing. And this key is actually really long, hence why the signature is so long. Now, this process works similarly. The only difference now is that you have to load the public key in order to verify that token. And J PyJot, much like the other libraries, also can give you a way for doing so. Uh, in this case, I have to import the serialization module from the library. I pass along the path where the key was saved, and I use RSA, RSA key. Uh, I can just read it, pass it along to the load, because it's an SSH public key, pass along to the load method. And once that key is loaded, I can use it the same way that I did my secret, passing along the algorithms, and the information will be given back to me if that token is good to go. Now, you may be wondering, fine, I understand what they are, I understand how they work, I see some Python code so I can figure out how to get it to be written, validated, get the data from it, right? But you may be wondering, why do I use this? Why is this important? And where do you find JWTs in the wild, you may be wondering. So the first way that you've probably seen as a Pythonista is an access token. Access tokens don't necessarily need to be JSON Web tokens, but if you're following the latest trends and the latest standardizations, they're using an RFC for that too. Uh, the outlines how access tokens, how JWTs can be used as access tokens. And the idea would be, let's say you are trying to use an API, that API is protected to make sure that you can have access to those endpoints, you need an access token that tells you, oh, you can perform these given actions, you can access that endpoint. And the RFC for that is the 1968, and it was authored by Vittorio Bertocci, uh, principal architect of Out0. Now, the other way that you might see JWTs in the wild is as ID tokens. For me, that's the coolest use case because that helps you not overload your backend by making extra requests to get information from your user. Once your user logs in, your backend gives you back the ID token with the information from that user, so you can adjust the profile page, for example, with that information without needing extra requests. So you could have an ID token that has the name of the user, the name they prefer to be called, or the uh, link to their photo so that you can show that on a page, on a web app, building Django or Flask or whichever framework you prefer. Now, since we're talking about tokens, a little caveat here. You may have heard of refresh tokens. Refresh tokens never are JSON Web tokens, and they require a talk on, on its own, so I'm not going to be touching refresh tokens today. But if you want to learn more about that, I have amazing links on documentation and other uh, resources that you can uh, access. Now, finally, I guess the last bit of advice is how to be safer with JSON Web Tokens, right? Because we've seen the JSON Web Tokens all over the web. We use them to protect our endpoints and access protected endpoints. Uh, we use them for our users if, to carry our users' information. So being safer with them is important. So a few tips. First, don't store your JSON Web Tokens on local storage. If you need to store them somewhere, defer it to the back end. So if you are working as a back ender and you need to work with somebody that does the front end, ask them not to do a storing of JSON Web Tokens in local storage. Say, oh, hey, you need to pass them to the back end for me to deal with it. Second is we don't verify access tokens in the front end because access tokens are made for APIs that should be verified in the back end. Another important point. JSON Web Tokens are meant for being used in a space-constrained environment that is a request within the web, right? 
So the more data you have, the bigger your JSON Web Token is going to be. Uh, so try to keep only the relevant data that you actually really need for your systems to work, uh, and that will be better for you. Finally, speaking of data, don't put sensitive data in the JSON Web Token. And when I say that, people look at me funny and say, like, but don't you already have the name of the user in there? It's like, yes. But when I say don't put sensitive data, it's something like credit card information. And why? Because the payload and the header are only base64 encoded. And you can just Google it. You're going to find a bunch of websites that decode base64 and can get a hold of the data. And there goes your credit card information. So you don't want that to happen. So be very uh, mindful of the data that you have in a JSON Web Token. Now, to finalize our time together today, two tips that I want to share with you. First, you may need to debug some JSON Web Tokens while you're developing something. So access JWT.io. It is made by developers at Zero. We don't store the tokens that are pasted there. But please do not paste production tokens. It's not a good thing to do that um, anywhere, just because I say it's safe. Uh, but JWT.io is a very good resource that you can use uh, for validating tokens while you're, you're trying to develop things and figure out what is going wrong. Let's say you don't have a row in there and you need to figure out. That is a very easy tool to use. It is online. Uh, as long as you have access to the internet, you're good to go. Second, if you want to learn more about JSON Web Tokens, I have a free book uh, hosted on R0. It was written by one of our developers. Uh, so JWT Handbook, it is a great resource. You can learn a lot about how JSON Web Tokens are used, how, uh, what scenarios you can use them with, uh, how to be better, uh, how to be safer when using them. And that's it for today. If you have any questions, I would love to answer those outside. I also have some swag with me, some Yubi keys and some ring lights. So if you want to grab those, I would love to give them out. Thank you very much.